Pau Kola atvadovauja tarptautinėje vyriausybinėje organizacijai, kuri bingumas kultūrai ir rūgdymas, o Creativity, Culture and Education, įgyvendinusi pagrindinė Britanijos vyriausybės kruojama jaunimo kūrybiško ūkdymo programo kūrybinės partnerystės, Creative Partnership, 2010-2011 metais jis dirbo su, ši programa dirbo su 2500 mokyklų, kurios kuriuose mokosi apie trys ketvirtadaliai milijono jaunų žmonių. Paulas Kolardas konsultuoja kuriant ir įgyvendinant kūrybinių partneryšių programas Lietuvoje, Latvijoje, Norvegijoje, Vokietijoje ir Čekijos Respublikoje. Jis buvo jungtinės karalystės atstovas Europos Sąjungos darbo grupėje, nagrinėjo kultūros ir švietimo sinergijos skatinimo klausimus. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Would you like to use this one or that? I'll just use this one, actually, if that's all right. Um, I'm only going to uh, talk for a few minutes um, because I think the most important things about creative education and humanistic education has already been said this morning. Um, what I just wanted to do uh, was to give you one example uh, of a project here in Lithuania that I went to see three or four weeks ago, which was part of the Creative Partnerships Lithuania program, because I think it very brilliantly illustrates uh, some of the points you've been hearing about this morning. But if I just recap on some of the important points. Um, we had a very good presentation from Michael on the humanistic tradition, and what he made clear is that the ideas in education that we're talking about are not new. They go back to the foundations of European civilization. Um, and I think the UNESCO definitions, the four pillars of education, are a very useful lens for understanding what we're talking about. There is an obsession in education systems with the learning to know and the learning to do, acquiring knowledge and developing skills. And it is very often at the expense of learning to be and learning to live together. And I think it's really important that we put the learning to be, discovering who you are as a person and how you function, and the learning to live together, which is the process through which you develop for yourself the moral and ethical framework which governs your behavior, which lies at the heart of creativity and was exactly what Guy was talking about at the end there. Um, those have to be central to education. We have this little model which then also refers to um, a, an aspect of education which has been um, touched on by the speakers um, so far to help understand what it is that Creative Partnerships uh, Lithuania or Creative Partnerships generally tries to do. What you have in the uh, bottom left-hand corner there is uh, low-performing schools, and education systems want to improve them. And what they tend to do to improve them is move them up to the top left-hand side, which is put in systems to make them more efficient. More tests, standard curriculum, more inspections, all this kind of thing in order to do it but they often remain low-functioning schools. And by this, we mean that it uses a small amount of the person because the bit that your education is asking you to use is really just your memory and your whole person is not being used. A lot of cultural activities exist in the bottom right-hand side and they're provided for fun. They're a reward for putting up with being in a school in the top left-hand side. Uh, this was a point that Guy was making but they're not connected with the real learning. And what we've always been about is how you get cultural and creative activities into the learning by making them high system, but also high functioning. The high functioning is a concept um, which we've been doing uh, quite a lot of work on. Uh, this model is partly borrowed, in fact, from a piece of work that one of Guy's um, collaborators um, has developed. They did a study of studio schools, which is a big movement in England now, to try and identify what the pedagogy uh, was that went on in uh, studio schools. And I really liked it, but I've developed it with further research, which the University of Cambridge has been doing, which has been doing a lot of observations in Creative Partnerships classrooms. And essentially, the low functioning on the left describes uh, 
a fairly traditional approach to education. And the high functioning is um, what we're looking for um, there. The role of the teacher changes, and uh, the point again that Guy was making about guiding people to the solution, is that this is a big problem. And teachers, by practicing that, actually do two things. With, high, with low, uh, lower performing children, the children never learn to find the answer uh, without being guided. But with the higher performing children, they work out the teacher's going to tell them the answer in the end. So in the average 45 minute class, they only need to wake up for three minutes, which is towards the end, and they're told the answer. And they really don't engage in, in the rest of that process. The nature of activities need to be authentic um, versus contrived and artificial. And you can see all these points are ones which relate directly to what Guy was talking about, the characteristics of the teaching uh, and the practice and the learning that goes on in um, the, the classroom. And why this high functioning bit is a phrase that's really stuck with us now is it comes from research as I said, done by the University of Cambridge. And essentially they've developed this model in which they say what happens in a creative education is the whole child is being used. Not just their memories, but their eyes, their ears, their bodies, they move, their emotions, their feelings, their social skills. Um, that is all taking place within the lesson. And when that happens, it leads to feelings of well-being inside. And from the well-being comes the confidence, which actually allows you to become autonomous and um, develop agency, that sense that you can make a difference to your own life. It's born of the confidence that comes of using the whole of you in your learning. And that results in high performance. And this particular piece of, of research was specifically done because we've done a lot of research on creative partnerships in the UK to show it does improve test results, it does improve behavior, it does all that. This research was trying to understand why does it happen? What happens in the classroom? And this is a key model for us now in how to put it all together. Now let's apply it uh, to a project. It's uh, from a, a primary school in Kaunas. And the teachers involved in this are actually here. And there is a, a fuller presentation that I'm going to give um, available to you. And you can meet them and ask questions. So uh, these are the children in the school. Um, the, uh, it's a primary school. And schools in the program um, focus the project um, that they're going to work on, on an, an issue in the school they want to work on. That's key in creative partnerships. They define a learning issue. And in this particular is, um, school, they wanted to work with this class on writing in particular, using uh, letters, because they felt that this was a weakness. In this photograph, the children are listening. This is the first day that they're working with the artists. They are listening to the school, and the artist has got them to lie there and simply listen to all the sounds that they can hear. On the second day, they go out and begin to visit uh, the town. Here they are at the railway station, and the task that they have is to listen to the station and to write down the sounds they hear. They have to invent words using letters which capture the sounds of the railway station. They then move on to a subway, and they're doing the same. They're listening to the sounds the whole time, and they're writing those signs down, uh, those sounds down using um, uh, the letters, and so forth. And you can see there's this intense concentration uh, in their work. Now they've gone to an indoor market, and they're capturing the sounds of the indoor market. Writing, 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 and so forth. And again, that intense concentration and looking at the world around them. Now they're trying to hear what a sculpture sounds like. <laughs> then, and I love this bit, they, they took them on another day to the university to a Turkish class. Right? None of them were Turkish. None of them had ever come across Turkish. And they had to sit in class and write Turkish just by listening to the lecturer delivering a Turkish class. And there they are. They're writing it down. Again, the concentration and the focus of their work. Uh, then they went to visit the theatre, but they bumped into the mayor, and he wanted a photograph taken with them. So this is just the political advert. <laughs> then they went to the church, and they listened to the church. We're fascinated. Then they came back, 
And here they were working in groups with the language they had invented of the sounds of their city and looking at the different words, understanding which were the really great ones. And here is um, some of their writing. I've learned a little bit of <laughs> Lithuanian here. But you can see at the top up there is Stotis, which is station. And the first word that you see there is Czechtikas. It's the sound of the train coming into the station. Czechtikas, Czechtikas, Czechtikas. And then it puts its brakes on. And it's sas, sas, and that sound of the brakes coming through. And so they're, they're using all these sounds to create words, really dealing with the letters. And then they're given a task of um, choosing a painting, and they then have to create a soundtrack for that painting, um, the, just using their mouths. Any sounds the mouths can use, they have to write them down, and then they record them. I didn't practice it, so it might not work for sound. No, they, it, this is a picture of paradise, and they make this extraordinary sound, which is their version of the sound of paradise that, that they do. So, if you go back to um, what Guy was talking about, the defining creativity, this was a literacy class. They were doing literacy. It's really important we get literacy standards up. But the, the work, the lesson, had been created in a way that they had plenty of time to be curious, inquisitive, and observant. You saw those photographs of them out, really looking at their city, determined that the whole task, which is, have I got that sound right? Shall I do some more? Shall I come up with some more words for those sounds? And they're sticking with the uncertainty of it. There's no clear answers there. Being imaginative visualizing acoustically, using their brains to come up with the sound of paintings, but also they were visualizing acoustically by creating the words of the sounds that they heard, and so forth. And metaphor, the sound of paradise was in there. They were tinkering, drafting, experimenting. They were collaborative. You could see how they came to work in, tool, um, in teams. They were using computers and sound, recording, and they were help, um, they were discerning. It was helping them explore and discover what is deeply satisfying. Because that final piece of work that, of going, yeah, that's brilliant in order to be able to do it. So a lot of time when you talk about creativity, people think it's an either or. And our answer is it's not an either or. It is the way you plan to deliver the curriculum you need to do in such a way that these characteristics can be practiced every day because they're actually nurtured by continuous practice. This project that um, a guy was talking about that we've been collaborating on, and indeed with the OECD as well, which has been looking at how to define um, um, creativity and how to measure its progression. As part of this, um, um, Guy's team has been working with some teachers, and... Um, We've had teachers um, come in and go through these terms because we're very anxious that these are words that teachers feel confident with, that they use easily um, in what they do. And we go through these and we say, does this make sense to you as definitions of creativity? And the teachers go, absolutely. And we go, and do you think curiosity is important? And they go, it's absolutely essential to learning. <laughs> it's absolutely essential to learning of any kind. So we say, go back to your classroom and spend a couple of weeks and come back and tell us if your children are curious. And every time we've done this, and I've done it in other countries as well, the teachers come back after two weeks, we go, did you find out? And they said, well, we didn't. And we said, why not? We said, we realized there was very little time in the school day to ask any questions. You're too busy getting on with doing things. Well, what I wanted to show you with that project is that all these characteristics that we think are important, with the right planning, can deliver the core curriculum. It isn't a different curriculum, it's how you plan the lessons in order to give young people the space to practice these every day. So by the time they get to be 18, this is absolutely deeply embedded uh, in their nature. Thank you very much indeed.